Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gronje Healy, Chair of the Sláinte Care Citizen and Staff Engagement Forum, and I'm delighted on behalf of Laura McGahey, Executive Director of Sláinte Care, to welcome you to this webinar, the first Sláinte Care Integration Fund webinar as part of our Learning Network event series. If COVID-19 has shown us anything, it's that change can happen at speed when it is the right change happening at the right time and for the benefit of patients and service users. The Sláinte Care Integration Fund Learning Network, which you are all part of today, is a huge part of that work. The projects that the Integration Fund supports have innovation at their core. I'm delighted that you're all coming together to learn from one another and share best practice. service rapidly went from two to seven days and from a Wicklow only to a Wicklow plus service and this was possible because of the buy-in of the various stakeholders in the project. The final model for it I guess is something that we have to decide in terms of sustainability moving forward. Having the occupational therapist be the anchor was certainly beneficial and it may be that in the future a community paramedic rather than an advanced paramedic slash doctor model is favoured. Project. So I'll just tell you a little bit about mine. Um, as I said, I work in St. James's Hospital and I've helped coordinate LAMP, the Local Asset Mapping Project, which is a social prescribing project for older people attending our clinics, uh, which makes it unique in Ireland because it's hospital based. But we have the same problems of physical inactivity, loneliness, social isolation and mild mental health issues here. Some challenges that have emerged during COVID with us, um, obviously um, with a lot of services have reduced or stopped. And we can see that there's a danger of the link worker becoming the service, which isn't the intention. The link worker is a, is a bridge to different, to join up different services. And um, there's an emerging problem with the digital divide, a divide of digital poverty, where some people have the skills or the technology of a broadband to access all these services online and other people don't. Part of our response to that has been to do domiciliary visits. So our social prescribing coordination visits people in the home as well as online and as well as in our clinics. And we're up to north of 30 referrals in just a month. So it's getting very busy. We have evaluation built in because I work in Trinity as well. So we've applied for ethics to test or observe all of everything that we're doing. Uh, our seven work stream is we managed to keep our Slaunch Care project running, especially around uh, using technology to map the data, the supports that we were giving older people and the prescription, technological prescription to older people. Service, one of the questions we asked the GP is, what would you have done if you didn't have a virtual consultation? And without the virtual consultation, for every 100 cases, 78% would have gone to the outpatient department, 12 to the AMU or ED, and 10 to community, would be an ongoing community care. As a result of the virtual consultation, the 78 being referred to and added to this growing face-to-face -face outpatient waiting list, 78% became 8%, 12% going to the acute services became 2%, and there was a complete inversion of community care from 10% to a 90% shared general practitioner specialist care within the community. And you can see on the right, the KPIs for the project have been achieved to date and will of course be achieved by the end of the year given the, the strong success of this to date. The overall findings of this audit show that a sizable majority of patients are considered by their condition to be appropriate for appointments by telehealth. Technical difficulties were not prevalent and patients were happy not to have to travel for care. The comfort, length and thoroughness of all appointments was mostly good or excellent. The overall experience by both clinicians and patients was either good or excellent for all encounters. The experience of telehealth was similar in the pre and post COVID era, indicating that there was no special view of patients about their care during the post COVID time. More than 90% of outpatient visits across Beaumont and James's were conducted via telehealth, thus far exceeding our stated goal in the original telehealth project, which was 60% reduction. So in terms of work done so far, we've established a governance group with um, clinical expertise and 
expertise on it and a governance charter that can support the maintenance of this project and the governance of this project in an ongoing way. Uh, we have a project plan and a content plan which maps out all of the pieces that we'll produce over the next 12 months. Uh, we have a content strategy and guides including very clear workflows and processes. So with such a huge volume of content and so many people involved, we needed really clear workflows and processes to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Um, and we've also been busy with the Coronavirus Health Guide, which consists of over 50 pages that have been iterated over 350 times as we've moved through the, the past six months. Um, uh, so keeping that up to date as evidence emerges, as the advice changes, and as user feedback comes through in terms of what's useful um, and what works for people and what people need to know. Um, Socially distant chat is a lifeline. The 90-year-old struggles with loneliness and depression. After my wife passing away and shortly afterwards my, my sister died, I had no one really and uh, I, had to get the, I had to get help because uh, my life was pointless at that stage. John sought that help from AgeWell in 2018, a care coordination programme for older people in Meath. And during the COVID crisis, he says, it's been even more important. So without them, she had no one because I couldn't go out. And, uh, you know, and I'm a person to exercise a lot. I like to get out and meet people. But when I was taken away, my life was taken away, really. In the 18 months since AgeWell was set up, it's proven hugely successful. We've reduced loneliness by 75%, which is absolutely huge. And we've also increased uh, their well-being, overall well-being by 40%, and increased their self-rated health by 21%, bearing in mind that the mean age of these older people is 82. This programme only operates here in County Meath, but it's hoped it can be rolled out right across the country if funding becomes available, so that people in similar situations to John can benefit too really unbelievably long wait lists. So for the patient, if we can shorten these wait lists, what kinds of outcomes are you seeing when your app works and the wait lists get shortened and people get the specialist uh, consultancies that they, they so need? Yes, well, I suppose, Grony, it's still aspirational, but if we, if we believe the dream, I guess, the, the subset of patients, I mean, it's, it won't be everybody. There will be people who will still obviously have to go on the waiting list, but if we can decant a proportion of them appropriately, that means that, you know, the effects for them uh, uh, could be potentially profound. Their GP within the week could have instigated their care pathway rather than them waiting perhaps three to four years even. So, I mean, that's a potentially huge effect. But I suppose also for, for us, um, you know, the person who genuinely needs urgent surgery, because I said, you know, over half of the people who do attend us don't go the surgical route straight away. Yeah. So what happens then is potentially we're distilling down the uh, referrals that are coming into us so that the people who are really in need of urgent surgery get to see us sooner and get their surgery sooner. So it has, it has implications on, on both sides of it. So, and that's fantastic. Obviously, the longer people wait who are in dire need, they potentially can't work maybe can't mobilize they become housebound and all of the you know psychosocial implications of that uh, while they languish on a waiting list notwithstanding that but their comorbidities potentially go up because they can't mobilize they become obese uh, you know so their potential post-operative complications come up so there really is far-reaching uh, implications of getting to the surgical group faster but of course that's always the challenge but this is one method. very briefly we've opened a rapid assessment clinic in the ambulatory care hub we've developed um, a very robust ambulatory care pathway um, from the EDs to the ambulatory care hub so it enables um, older, po older people to be assessed in the ED discharged the same day um, and have their care needs managed in the, in the community. The Science Care funding has enabled us uh, to provide a more thorough fit team response at the front door we have a CNS and a registrar now in, in, in our fit teams alongside our, our therapists. We've also um, enabled the outreach team to be aligned to this pathway. Again, we've added resource to that team in terms of a physiotherapist and an, and an, and an occupational therapist, which again has increased their capacity. We've developed a system for transferring clinical information from the acute hospital to the community and back again. Um, and we have ensured the onward uh, referral pathways were robust and were able to manage with the patients that we were referring into them. I felt at the time that if I hadn't had here, I didn't know where to go or what to do because 
the hospitals were I was getting uh, calls from the hospital stating that uh, I wasn't to go to any kind of outpatients. So it was unbelievable getting that call. It was a great relief and because with the history that I have with amputations on my toes, uh, it was very scary. And once I seen the people here, they really put my mind at ease and they were on it from the whole goal, like, you know. Aiden and whoever else, uh, first class, they, they automatically make you feel it is. They tell you what's going to happen out in the car with your mask and everything else. And uh, you know the routine when you come in, you're not waiting around. If you have an appointment at half nine, you have it. Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here today and to have uh, listened actively um, in today's session and it was incredibly interesting to hear uh, the role that technology and e-health is already playing um, in changing how things are delivered for the better for the patients that, that everybody sees. Over the previous webinars we've heard from many other projects which have had to change their delivery model due to COVID-19 and their focus is on managing as much care as possible in the community through the rapid deployment of e-health solutions. The agile and creative response to the unprecedented challenges faced by you in the delivery of services to the public is a credit to you all. Thank you again to everyone and I look forward to our next webinar which will take place as Gronje has said on Thursday 22nd of October. Thanks again.